All right, I think we're going to begin everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, the first thing that I would like to note is that it is 2 p.m. on the 22nd of the 2nd, 2022. So a very auspicious moment for us all. So welcome. Um, let me just bring up, where are we? Okay. Um, so kia ora everyone, welcome. My name is Therese Lloyd and I'm the Communications Manager at Fulbright New Zealand. We're delighted that so many of you can join us for our first Fulbright New Zealand Works Alumni Seminar of 2022. So before we begin, just a reminder to all of our guests to please remain on mute throughout the discussion. There will be time at the end of the presentation to ask any questions and we also encourage you to write any questions you may have in the chat box throughout. One final reminder that all works presentations are recorded and available to view on Fulbright New Zealand's YouTube channel. We are really delighted to present today's speaker who is Cornelia Weiss. Cornelia received an Ian Axford Fellowship to New Zealand in 2012 where she researched the New Zealand military's approach to respect human rights. Her policy recommendations, while on award, led to the creation of New Zealand's first national action plan to align with the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 that reaffirms the crucial role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts. Now a retired US Air Force Colonel, Cornelia has been the recipient of many awards, including the US Air Force Kenan Award for her contribution to the development of international law. She joins us today from Washington, DC. Please welcome Cornelia Weiss. Well, thank you all very much. And I am just delighted to be here today. Um, and when I say here today, I, I mean, actually, the 21st at 8 p.m. Um, but uh, with that, I will start. Um, first of all, thank you all very much. And I am delighted to be here today, um, here being in New Zealand, even though it is virtually rather than in person. And I know how fortunate I was to be in New Zealand a decade ago as an Ian Axford Fellow. And of course, before I begin, permit me to issue a disclaimer. That is, although I am a former member of the US military, retiring in the rank of Colonel, what I say today is my personal opinion and not necessarily that of the US government, the US military or any of its components. And of course, because I am from the US, part of my talk today will be US focused. So in 2012, I came to New Zealand because I needed New Zealand. I had served in places like Colombia, where respect for human rights was crucial to get to peace rather than continued war. Yet in 2010, 2011, some of my military counterparts were saying to me, Cornelia, that is great you believe in human rights, but to win, you have to violate human rights. I knew I needed to learn from a country that did not have a record of violating human rights. And the Ian Axford Fellowship provided me that opportunity. For that, I am immensely grateful. I learned much from New Zealand and the New Zealand Defense Force. And my report of what I learned um, I believe will be placed in the chat right now. So today I wish to take this opportunity given by Fulbright New Zealand Good Works to explore with you an evolving concept of mine, which I am calling gender strategies. And indeed it is because of my time as an Ian Axford fellow, during which I learned about Bougainville and New Zealand's gender strategy for bringing peace that is driving my research even now a decade later. And given the fall of Kabul a half a year ago, I am returning to New Zealand, although virtually, in my quest for answers. I know I have much to learn from this very distinguished audience, and I look in forward to an intense discussion at the end of my talk and as always, I beg, ask the hard questions, because if we don't ask the hard questions, 
we will never get beyond the easy answers. So today, arguably, for the US, the days of overmatch that the US government has had, or the US military, I should say, has had are over. That is, we must, to paraphrase Churchill, think. With the recent fall of Kabul, thinking must include thinking about gender strategies. I contend that every military and civilian leader, whether consciously or unconsciously, creates and employs gender strategies. And by analyzing gender strategies, we may find that the questions needed to start to think, we may find questions that are needed to start to think beyond overmatch. And while my stated focus here today is on the military, it really is on the state and state assuming entities, be they recognized or not. So for example, in the US, the president is the commander in chief of the military. And one gender strategy, that of whether to cultivate on the basis of competence or chromosomes or other indicators continues incredibly to be contested today. To get beyond the fog and friction of today, I recommend we excavate history. So let us look back over 100 years ago to 1898 about what is today called the Spanish-American War. Now, before the start of the 1898 war, one of my childhood heroines, Annie Oakley, the world's best sharpshooter, writes a letter to then US President McKinley. And for a copy of that letter, I thank the Garst Museum and the National Annie Oakley Center in Greenville, Ohio. So in her letter to President McKinley, Annie Oakley writes, Dear Sir, I, for one, feel confident that your good judgment will carry America safely through without war. She continues, but in case of such an event, I am ready to place a company of 50 lady sharpshooters at your disposal. Every one of them will be an American. And as they will furnish their own arms and ammunition, there will be little, if any, expense to the government. President McKinley does not accept the offer of the world's best sharpshooter. If a commander in chief employs a gender strategy of excluding women, does that mean? that military is not interested in having the best? But my focus today though, is not on deciding who will and who will not be excluded from militaries. I use the example of M President McKinley's failure to accept the offer of the world's best to get beyond being mired in the endless debates about who and who should not be in the military it is beyond time to move on. So in my work, I seek to make visible the invisible. And to help start thinking, today I will highlight more recent gender strategies as well as excavate past gender strategies. Now a first step requires recognizing and analyzing gender strategies when examining how people and entities come to power. So given the fall of Kabul in 2021, let us look at the Taliban, at how the Taliban 1.0 came to power in the mid 1990s. It appears the Taliban 1.0 had a punish those who rape women and girls gender strategy that enabled them to come to power the power base and beginning of the Taliban and Mullah Omar, the head of the Taliban and de facto ruler of Afghanistan from roughly 1994 to 2001. In 1994, in Afghanistan, the internal war had spawned raiming, roping gangs of militiamen. Yet, 
that raping of women and girls was physically, psychologically, and culturally traumatic for Afghans who regarded this type of assault as the single most extreme violation of personal honor. Now the legend is that Mullah Armar took up arms when he heard news that two teenage girls from his village had been kidnapped by a local commander and were being gang raped at that commander's military base. Mullah Armar gathered religious students or Taliban and with only 30 of them and a handful of rifles, defeated the enemy forces and freed the captured girls and arrested the commander. And then ordered that the rapist commander be hung from the barrel of a tank and paraded through the streets as an example of all who dared to violate women and girls. Examining and addressing gender strategies also requires addressing the opposite gender strategy to gain power. That is planned strategic rape. Examples include Rwanda, as well as Bosnia and Herzegovina. In Rwanda, the Minister of Women devises a rape plan as part of the strategic genocide plan. In Rwanda, over the course of approximately 100 days in 1994, at least 800,000 Rwandans were killed, the majority women. Of the women who survived the genocide, 80% were raped. And the rape plan results in the raping of over 500,000 women, over 5,000 rapes per day. And 80% of those raped become HIV positive so even if a woman or a girl survives rape, rape continues to further genocide. Now, during the same time in Europe, the Psychological Operations Department of the Yugoslav National Army concludes that morale, desire for battle, and will of Muslims could be crushed more easily by raping women, especially minors and even children. Serb army officers develop a plan to rape women and children, quote, as an efficient and integral tool in undertaking the ethnic cleansing of Muslims in Bosnia and Herzegovina. One estimate is that Serb male military members rape 60,000 women in the war. And again, even if a woman or girl survive rape and are not killed, the long-term goal of exterminating the opponent is achieved. The multiple effects of rapes and gang rapes result in humiliating, dominating, instilling fear in, dispersing, and or forcibly relocating civilian members of a community or ethnic group. So what about creating counter strategies? Well, as you know, the Taliban 1.0 had one. What about the rest of the world? Today, the International Criminal Court recognizes that rape can be a war crime and a crime against humanity. Is the International Criminal Court the world's only counter strategy? We also need to recognize and analyze gender strategies of how people and entities stay in power. So let us look again at the Taliban 1.0 to see if it had a gender strategy that enabled it to stay in power. Well, it appears it did. It appears that the Taliban 1.0 used a women elimination strategy when it came to power in Afghanistan as a strategy to stay in power. Now, did the Taliban's women elimination strategy with its cascading effects create the vacuum they needed to rule? Or could the Taliban 1.0 have ruled without such a women elimination strategy. As you may know, in 1997, the Taliban banned women from working in public places. And through its ban, 
The Taliban caused the disappearance of half the population to include nearly 40% of civil servants in places like Kabul. What effect does this have on the ability of society to function? Does harming women and girls help or harm men and boys? Now, given that women were an estimated 70% of school teachers, the Taliban's ban against women also harms the capacity of boys to be educated. And according to the US Congressional Research Service, the Taliban 1.0 inflicts severe corporal punishment or capital punishment, often publicly, upon women accused of breaking restrictions. So how many women to include widows and their children were then left only with the options of begging or prostitution to survive. So what was the world's counter strategy? In addressing the women elimination gender strategy of the Taliban 1.0, the UN Security Council issues lots of words via a series of UN Security Council resolutions. For example, in an August 1998 resolution, the UN security, quote, urges the Afghan factions to put an end to the discrimination against girls and women and to other violations of human rights, as well as violations of international humanitarian law and to adhere to the internationally accepted norms and standards in the sphere. And it reminds all of the parties of the obligation to abide strictly by the decisions of the Security Council and it expresses its firm intention in accordance with its responsibility under the charter to consider such further steps as may be required for the implementation of the resolution. Then a few months later, in a December 1998 resolution, the UN Security Council again, quote, demands that the Afghan factions put an end to discrimination against girls and women and other violations of human rights, as well as violations of international humanitarian law, and that they adhere to the international norms and standards in the sphere. And then 10 months later, in an October 1999 resolution, the UN Security Council expresses, quote, deep concern over the continuing violations of international humanitarian law and of human rights, particularly discrimination against women and girls. Did any of these words by the UN Security Council end the Taliban's women elimination strategy? Now recognizing and analyzing gender strategies also requires examining the gender strategy of the U.S. in the longest war in U.S. history, arguably ending in August 2021, as a result of the February 29, 2020 agreement titled, quote, Agreement for Bringing Peace to Afghanistan Between the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, which is not recognized by the United States as a state and is known as the Taliban and the United States of America. As some of you may know, in 2010, the US Secretary of State promises that the US would not abandon the women of Afghanistan. The December 2006 US military manuals appear to articulate the gender strategy of the US military for the longest war in US history as co-opting women. In contrast, the New Zealand Defense Force, while in Afghanistan, appears to have done the opposite. Did the US gender strategy of co-opting women work or did it fail? Did the US fulfill or fail to fulfill the promise to the women of Afghanistan that the US would not abandon them. 
So let us now turn to gender strategies for peace. If militaries make decisions based on evidence as to best strategies to end international insecurity, then the logical conclusion, given data just demonstrating the relationship between gender inequality and international insecurity, is that eradicating gender inequality should be the top priority. And lest one believe that eradicating gender inequality is not a job for militaries, a look back in history may prove instructive. For example, I urge us to re-remember and teach the forgotten gender strategy of five-star General Douglas MacArthur. So can you guess what his first demand for reform in post-World War II occupied Japan, what it was? Did you guess that over 75 years ago, to fulfill his obligations under the Potsdam Declaration, which included demilitarization, General MacArthur, as Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers of post-World War II occupied Japan, makes his first demand for reform, the emancipation of women. What, you were never taught this? I too was never taught this. And should you wish to read more, my article on General MacArthur's women's emancipation policy should be now put in the chat. So I thank you. Now, in his first meeting with the Japanese military of post-World War II occupied Japan, General MacArthur expresses the following expectation. Quote, in the achievement of the Potsdam Declaration, the traditional social order under which the Japanese people for centuries have been subjugated will be corrected. General MacArthur's gender strategy appears based on this statement to be based on a belief that the center of gravity for Japan's militarism was its societal structure with women and girls at the bottom, which emancipating women and girls could change. And indeed, one result of the first elected female members of the Japanese parliament, due to suffrage no longer being denied to women, is them convincing General MacArthur of the need for food for the Japanese people. What will happen and is happening in Afghanistan in this first year of what I call occupation by Taliban 2.0. For reducing starvation, will the Taliban 2.0's gender strategy of eliminating women be better or worse than General MacArthur's women's emancipation gender strategy? And in recognizing and analyzing gender strategies, we also need to address culture. That is, as I've learned from Bougainville, each institution has its own gender culture. That is relationships between women and men. For example, who holds the more powerful positions, has access to more resources, has stronger networks, which they can appropriate to their own ends. And as you know, one of the oft raised arguments about Afghanistan was and is that of imposing culture. Likewise, over 75 years ago, General MacArthur heard, quote, experts voicing similar cultural arguments. And culture, as you know, is often used as an excuse for discrimination. A 1940s US military manual on military government for occupations stated that changes in existing laws, customs, and institutions are to be avoided. The rationale, quote, the existing laws, customs, and institutions of the country have been created by its people and are presumably those best suited for them. They and the officers and employees of their government are familiar with them. And any changes will impose additional burdens 
upon the military government. Therefore, it follows from the basic policies of welfare of the governed and economy of effort that the national and state laws and local ordinances of the occupied territories should be continued in force, the habits and customs of the people respected and their governmental institutions continued in operation, except insofar as military necessity and other cogent reasons may require a different course. So this is 1940. Now, after entry into World War II, the US military, perhaps influenced by the war against Nazi Germany, revises its manual in 1943 to state, quote, laws which discriminate on the basis of race, color, creed, or political opinions should be annulled as the situation of permits. However, the practice of such customs or observances of such traditions as do not outrage civilized concepts may be permitted. Do customs, traditions, and quote, civilized concepts that discriminate against women and girls not fall in to the category of outrage? Notice the revised military manual, that of 1943, ignores discrimination against women and girls. Is this why, despite the post-World War I peace treaty of Versailles outlawing pay discrimination against women, in the post-World War II occupation of Germany, the US and British occupy, occupying forces pay women 25% less than men for the exact same manual jobs. For example, cleaning toilets. Now, after a year in a female majority land that is post-World War II occupied Germany, the all-male control council for post-World War II occupied Germany, made up of the Soviet Union, France, the UK, and the US, they pass a supplement to the wage policy stating, quote, the wages of women may be raised to the same level paid to men for identical work with identical productivity. Note the language. It does not state must, it states may. And then compounding this, the council then prohibits publication of this supplement permitting equal pay. And to date in my research, I have encountered no other control council supplement that was forbidden to be published. Why? To maintain culture, tradition, concepts that harm women? Only a year earlier, the 1945 UN Charter's preamble states, we, the people of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, reaffirm faith in the equal rights of men and women. Today, under the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, a convention that almost all, but not all, states have ratified, states' parties may, or not may, they shall take all appropriate measures to modify the social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women with a view of achieving the elimination of prejudices and customary and all other practices which are based on the idea of the inferiority or the superiority of either of the sexes or on stereotyped roles for men and women. So what if we looked at culture in a different way? That is going beyond the excuses. And here 
and getting beyond the use of culture as an excuse to use gender strategies that ignore and violate the rights of girls and women requires examining a gender strategy created and used by the New Zealand Defense Force. During the first rotations of the Truce Monitoring Group in Bougainville, starting on 20 November, 1997. Recognizing the culture of Bougainville was vital. As explained by the 23 January, 1998, Lincoln Peace Talks Women's Statement. In almost all areas of Bougainville, women traditionally own the land. The land is sacred and protected by men on behalf of women. Understanding culture requires understanding why different actors may have different roles. For Bougainville, according to the 2016 policy for women's empowerment, gender equality, peace and security, quote, one traditional reason for women's historical exclusion from face-to-face -face political confrontation was that land disputes could sometimes escalate into physical attacks or death by sorcery. That is, if mothers as custodians of the land were killed before their daughters had succeeded them, this could lead to ongoing inter-clan clashes about the use and custodianship of that land. And as you know, colonization is believed to have resulted in a disruption of women's traditional power over land. Colonial authorities employ a gender strategy of recognizing only the male, not the female, leadership roles. In Bougainville, women fought back. For example, in 1969, in a land struggle between landowners and the colonial administration, women pulled up the survey pegs that would steal the land beneath their feet and threw themselves in front of bulldozers. Proceeding Tiananmen Square by decades, the colonial administration claimed that the minerals belonged to the crown and as such compensation was paid only to those deemed to be direct landowners and only for development above ground and to the depth of three meters. Therefore, called in police riot squads to drive the women off with batons. And as you and New Zealand know, then in the mid 1970s, Bougainville, despite having issued its own declaration of independence, was placed under the authority of Papua New Guinea. More conflict arose with Papua New Guinea imposing a blockade on Bougainville. And then in January, 1990, Papua New Guinea withdrawing all its public servants and closing banks, government office and services, including all medical clinics, government and community schools. Now, Papua New Guinea expects a capitulation of the Bougainville population in four months time. There is no capitulation. Instead, the Bougainville conflict is the deadliest in the Pacific Island since World War II, resulting in the death of one of every 10 Bougainvillians. With Bougainville transforming, as noted by a New Zealand Defense Force member, from a well-educated, well-medicated nation to that of living in difficult and unsafe circumstances, especially for women. When in 2012, as an Ian Axford Fellow, I interview 
the head of the first rotation of the 1997 Truce Monitoring Group, New Zealand Defense Force Brigadier Mortlock. He informs me that a precondition for peace for Bougainville was to bring power back to the women. In Bougainville, Lieutenant Colonel Janet Castell of the New Zealand Defense Force, she engages with the two opposing female leaders together, going from village to village to spread the peace process. Castell finds the women of Bougainville awesome with a clear vision of what they wanted and what they hoped to achieve. Given the tyranny of terrain in Bougainville, making transportation difficult, military assets are used to host significant meetings for the women of Bougainville to include support to get women to meetings, as well as supporting liaison visits to establish what the women of Bougainville want out of the peace. Indeed, Josephine Surivi, one of the Bougainvillian leaders, acknowledges that a meeting to elect a national executive of the women's representatives from all the different areas of Bougainville was made possible by the transport assistance, and that there were women among the truce monitors who supported efforts to establish the women's network and recognize the interest shown by the women to be come formally involved in the peace process through the organization. In particular, Sir Reeby highlights Major Fiona Cassidy and Colonel Janet Castell from the New Zealand Defense Force. Sir Reeby explains, quote, during our awareness campaign trips, we attracted large crowds who were eager to hear all the news and were happy to hear the outcome of our campaigns. We recognized that we were the only ones among the leaders who had been to the peace negotiations who were briefing ordinary people about the peace process. That is, while the men did attend organized meetings and spoke with the village chiefs, the women worked to instill the truce within the population by seeking out people who had no official responsibilities and heard only scraps of information. As one monitor in Bougainville recounts, if you approach the chief of a village about problems in his village, he may say there are no problems because of his pride and the fact he feels he may be losing power. If you consult the women, they will tell you what really takes place and give you insight into the powers of influence of the chief. As I near the end of my talk, let me restate that recognizing and analyzing gender strategies is but a first step in articulating and illuminating what heretofore appears to have been unseen and unstated. Know that recognizing and analyzing gender strategies can serve as the illuminating aha for those serious about international security, but also for those who wish to perpetuate insecurity. As recognized by the Bougainville Policy for Women's Empowerment, Gender Equality, Peace, and Security, awareness might not necessarily generate any will or resolve to act on the basis of gender awareness. In fact, it is possible for gender awareness to generate resistance, obstruction, and or other practices. So a few questions. Would it make and have made a difference if the education pro provided to political, diplomatic, and military members enables students to think about gender strategies? For example, US students 
who then went on to be part of the two decades that the US was in Afghanistan and how the US departed from Afghanistan? Does ignoring gender strategies carry the risk of being outsmarted by those who wish to perpetuate insecurity? Does resisting, obstructing, and otherwise and refusing to recognize and analyze gender strategies endanger national and international security? Will military and civilian educators, creators of military and civilian doctrine, and drafters of national security strategies after today continue to refuse to address gender strategies? My hope talking with this very distinguished audience of change makers is that you welcome the opportunity to do the opposite, to include New Zealand leading the way by addressing gender strategies in the education, doctrine, and practices of the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the New Zealand Defense Force. And with that, I conclude and I thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Cornelia. That was a fascinating seminar and just incredibly thought provoking, I think, for everyone um, in attendance. Um, I just wanted to say that it's really fantastic to know that you have done so much work in the space of gender strategies within, within militaries and also that you're continuing to do that work, not just with sharing with us today, but in your own research as well. And so, yeah, really, really thought provoking discussion. Thank you. Um, if anybody does have any questions for um, Cornelia, please do um, unmute your screens or, or put your videos on however you want to do it and feel free to just ask. Alternatively, um, if you don't want to do it that way, you can also just write your question in the chat box and um, and we can monitor that and, and Cornelia will be able to see that as well. Um, but yeah, fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it might be that Lady Joy, Lady Joy Axford, um, I see a hand there, so I don't know if um, Lady Joy Axford um, if you have a question, but I am deeply honored that you are here today. Um, it means so much to me. Um, and I um, feel immensely grateful that um, I had the opportunity to go to New Zealand um, as a Sir Ian Axford fellow um, in honor of your husband. Um, and for me, um, one of the highlights of my time in New Zealand was getting to meet you, um, getting to know you, and to continue the, our relationship um, through this past decade. And, and again, um, what an honor. And I'm very deeply honored that you are here tonight. So thank you, Lady Joy. Right. If anyone, everyone, oh, there you are. Um, Lady Axford, we've just noticed that you have um, got the little icon that is um, saying hands up, which means you might have a question, but I think that, that you put that on there from the start. So I'm not sure if you have a question per se, or if you just wanted to say hi, either or is absolutely fine. Um, feel free to just pipe up. Um, right. We do have a question from Judy Whips, which is in the chat box. Can you see that, Cornelia? Yeah, so I, I can. So, okay. so, um, so again, uh, Judy, Judy Whips is here. Um, she's a, uh, an, uh, Jane Adams expert. Um, and Jane Adams, as some of you may know, um, is one of the, uh, rare female um, recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize. And, um, and, and I'm honored um, 
that you're here tonight and that you're asking the question about um, thoughts about what non-military citizens can do to affect change. Um, I think uh, certainly um, for example, tonight that we have these discussions, right? Um, that we have these discussions. And I think it's very important that we don't have that wall that sometimes I feel gets created between military and civilian as if they are two separate um, entities and that they are necessarily have, um, that they're against each other. Um, I'm not saying that the, and certainly civilians should never be co-opted um, by, certainly civilians should never be co-opted by the military because civil military relations means that uh, the military is under uh, the civilians. So with that, the civilian, civilians have amazing power. Um, so for example, <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll just we'll just speak. Let's just speak about the U.S. here because I I, I am from the U.S. Um, the U.S. The nineteen seventy nine uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination. The U.S. is a hand is among the handful of nations that has not ratified that, and there is no outcry. There's no outcry in the U.S. Um, and again, here I am speaking in my personal capacity, but the ERA amendment in the US, um, you know, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian, whatever you are, but re recently the Department of Justice under um, the Biden administration uh, um, wrote to the, the National Archives saying, oh yes, um, well, the ERA, um, you know, that, that really is, is, even though it has, from my perspective, uh, fulfilled all of the prerequisites to become um, part of the US Constitution, um, that, and, and, and what the national, the head of the National Archives is supposed to do is sign off and, and then it becomes, uh, that, that process, uh, uh, is fulfilled for it to become part of the U.S. Constitution. Um, the Department of Justice has has written a letter saying, "Oh, that that that's really something for the courts or for for Congress to take care of." So um, these are all things where the civilians need to speak up. But where are the op eds? I I like like the ERA. Where is that? Where where are the op op eds on 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 the Convention on Elimination of Forms of all forms of discrimination against women. Again, those are two examples, but those are two examples that are completely, completely um, ignored, overseen. And, and maybe it's because there's a constant drumbeat of wars um, that, that obliterates that. And isn't that sad? Because that's part of, I think, responsibility of all of us. So, uh, Okay, so a next question I see, a military historian recently said, making war is easy, making peace is hard, and do you see a greater role for women in helping to make peace? Yes, um, but what ha needs to happen here is, uh, you, you have to, and again, this is for the civilian part, right? So there are studies out there that's, that um, have concluded that uh, if you exclude women from peace negotiations, um, your probability of getting to peace uh, will be significantly reduced. And even if you do, your peace will be of lesser quality and of lesser, um, uh, that it won't last as long as peace agreements that do not exclude women in the peace negotiations. Well, let's just look at the, uh, recent, uh, quote, negotiations in Afghanistan, okay? Um, I have looked at this and you, 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 just, you just go down the list. Did, did the U.S. include women as peace negotiators? No. 
Even countries like Norway, did they include women as peace negotiators? No. But you look down at every single, every single state that has, was involved in those negotiations, and other than the government of Afghanistan, not a single one included women. Now there was one woman uh, appointed for the UN, but then the UN Secretary of General, Secretary General, he then appoints a man to quote help her. And if you look at a photo of that man, he's only with men. So to me, that just doesn't seem like we're very serious about peace. So. Uh, you know, it's just ridiculous. I, I think we, I think, you know, there are lots of words that get spoken. There are lots of, there's lots of research, lots of money going to research, but where's the action? It doesn't happen. And I have to say, I just don't think that there's the walking of the talk that's just not existing. And I just don't think that there is any serious intention for peace. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know what more to say about that. Okay, so a, a next one from Sam M. Bo. Um, Thanks, Cornelia, as an academic, do you have any ideas for how to join forces between civilian organizations and military change makers? And I wonder about pooling resources. So I think what needs to happen um, and I, is, is that we need to have more conversations like we have here tonight. Um, we need to not view each other as um, strangers or opponents, um, but that we need to understand that we need to work together. And yes, like in any um, in everything, not all your interests are going to align, but you figure out what does align and, and then you go forward. But then I think what's important too is I think you need civilian oversight. So if the military says we're going to do something, well, then you also need the civilians there saying, okay, are you doing it? What are you doing it? What are you doing? And also to say, what are you not doing? And why are you not doing? That there needs to be that accountability, but you also need people who understand the military, who can, under, who can decipher some of that military speak to realize really what is happening and what is not happening. I think that's a really good point, Cornelia, and I think that's why work that you've been doing is so important because you've got both of those perspectives. Um, which is great. We've got another question here from um, Alan. Um, can you see that, Cornelia? No, I can't, but that doesn't, so, you, you can read. Oh. oh. I'll, I'll pop in and actually ask the question. I, I was putting something in the chat there just saying I, I was responding to Sam as, as uh, somebody that works internal within defense, but very interested in engaging with uh, civilian academic colleagues. Uh, but Cornelia, I will. So a short introduction. I'm former Canadian military. Uh, I've worked closely with uh, colleagues in uh, multiple countries. The, the US uh, worked with Claire Burton back in the days in the late 90s when she was doing her work on in Australia and, and New Zealand. Uh, uh, so one of the issues we know with this is trying to bring understanding and perspectives on gender, gender awareness, um, or as our ambassador for WPS points out, Canada's gift to the world of GBA plus the diversity, the intersectional factors. Um, the challenge with this is we're trying to get a military organization to incorporate these and and the military is a highly patriarchal highly masculinist organization um, if you go back to the Beijing platform that was one of the central things that was identified that we needed to tackle so my question is how do we get this understanding in an institution that is already highly gendered thank you right so I I thank you very much for asking that question and I think we need to go back and we actually have to look at history. So again, um, I, I, I'm going to go back and, 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 and ask that you all read uh, the work that I've done on 
uh, the post-World War II occupation of Japan. And it's just amazing. It's amazing what can happen. And, and Professor Okris, you know this too. If you tell the military to do something, those are orders. And the military is quite capable of following orders. And if it doesn't follow orders, well, then there needs to be consequences. And I frankly am not sympathetic to assertions that, oh, the military just simply reflects uh, society and that's why you have uh, sexism, that's why you have racism, et cetera, et cetera, um, because that's not the way the military works. And if you give orders, those orders need to be followed. And people who can't follow them, they should not be part of the military. And people who engage in sexism, racism, et cetera, et cetera, they should not be part of the military. So that's my perspective on that. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, so if anyone has any more questions, please feel free to pipe up now or um, include them in the chat box. Um, and then we will wrap up. Thanks, Judy. It was a great talk. I agree. Um, then we'll wrap up at three o'clock. Um, so any final questions? Okay, Danielle. Oh, she's clapping. Thank you. Hey, Scott, sorry. So, so again, um, I, I, I think we're, we're, we're at the end of our hour. I, I again, I, I thank uh, all of you for showing up. Um, the, the audience I see is uh, international here, very inter international. And for some, it's early morning. For others like me, it's uh, later at night, um, past my bedtime. But um, I, I want to thank you all very much, and 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 I want to thank uh, Fulbright New Zealand Good Works for enabling this talk to happen because I think talks like this are absolutely vital, um, and that there is that understanding about the military and about to get a better idea of what the military does and to understand that civilian oversight an understanding of the military is absolutely crucial. So I really hope um, that that helps, that this talk today uh, helps further that. And I look forward to seeing what happens as a result of this talk today. So again, thank you all very, very much. And I'm very honored by um, all of you for showing up. Um, I see lots of names here of people um, with, you know, for example, I see Ambassador Penny Wensley from Australia, and uh, she, we have her to thank for uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325. She was there during the open debate um, in 2000 uh, for 1325, and um, we have her to thank for that. Of course, there are others that we have to thank, but um, I don't want the memories of these individuals and their accomplishments to be forgotten. And, and again, with that, I will, I will conclude, but again, thank you all very much.